Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to this on crawl SEO Space Lab episode number six. Um, over the last week, we've been looking at the newest phenomena in the SEO cosmos with incredible guests. Uh, you can use the hashtag SEO Space Lab. You can ask questions at any time during the webinar using the chat section, sorry, and we will answer them at the end. Um, today's SEO Space Lab episode is about how to use A rank to unlock internal link potential on your site. Um, I'm Emma Labrador, Head of Marketing at OnCrawl, an award-winning technical SEO platform. And my guest today is Jenny Alaz. Welcome, Jenny. Hi, how is everybody today? Um, Jenny, you're the president and founder of GLH Marketing, uh, which is a consultancy that specializes in search strategy. Uh, you have over a decade of experience in search and you've worked for uh, dozens of blue chip clients as well as plenty of small enterprises and startups. Um, you contribute to a lot of different blogs such as Search Engine Journal. Uh, you've spoken to many conferences like PubCon and, and many more others. Um, and you're also one of our ambassadors. So um, anything else you, wanna, you want to, to, to add, Jenny? Uh, no, you read that bio absolutely perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you. I am uh, I, I'm really thrilled to be here. Thank you for joining us. Um, so let's dive in today's subjects. Okay, great. So just a quick review. Um, I, I've uh, been doing this a really long time and um, I have experience with really huge sites. That's the main thing I want to highlight because in rank is so powerful no matter what size site, but for huge, for big enterprise sites, large e-commerce sites, it's just, it's a game changer. So I wanted to start out by explaining that I had initially put this, put this uh, out there as, I saw clients have really huge success after the last core update with some changes that we used in rank to determine how to do. However, there was just a core update the other day. Um, and while all of my clients actually have done well in the update, uh, it is just too soon to be able to tell for sure if the internal linking changes that we had that we made had stuck, that they you know continued to work. Um, so I decided to shift the conversation here a little bit today just to show you a little bit more about how to really use in rank and if you're an on-crawl customer, that's great because InRank could do all of this stuff straight out of the box. Uh, but if you are not an on-crawl customer, you could still use a lot of different crawling tools to get this same sort of information. The benefit, I think, to on-crawl is that it kind of crunches the numbers for you and you don't have to worry so much about uh, getting, getting all your spreadsheets downloaded and, and matching it up with APIs and all that kind of stuff because OnCrawl does it for you. But the overall concept is still the same. Now, InRank is just like PageRank in terms of how it's structured. It is evaluating internal value on a scale from zero to 10, with 10 being the best. Uh, 10 is assigned to the home page or the start page if it's not your home page. Um, your primary page on your site is going to get assigned to 10. And then the in rank uses the page rank, the page rank algorithm, the original one. So maybe not exactly what Google's using today, but still something that really well approximates how that internal link value thro flows throughout your site. And if you want some more background on this, there was a great webinar um, last year with Dixon Jones and Julie Joyce um, talking about internal links. So this is going to be a little bit of a more advanced uh, look at things. And I do want you to hang with me, even if you haven't seen that introductory webinar. Um, but you may want to watch it back after watching that to get some of the some of the basics and we will be making this webinar available uh, via recording later so moving on let's talk about the old way versus the new way i'm sure everybody has heard that everything should be no more than three clicks from the home page stuff um, and that really is problematic and i'm going to show you why you end up with a really flat architecture 
So the new way is to think about, and when I say new, I'm thinking, you know, in really big air quotes because it's not new at all. It's the same as it's been all along. Um, but now SEOs are saying it too, um, that you want to create a clearly defined arch architecture. It's a little bit hard to see in these examples, so I have highlighted it for you to show you um, the how the architecture ends up laying out. So these are the exact same number of pages, categories, subcategories, and of course the home page, but ordered in a flat architecture versus a structured architecture. Now I have definitely seen sites where every single page is at that second or third level, um, which I definitely recommend against, um, but it can still work if it's done carefully. So to look at that, let's think a little bit about what Google cares about, what users care about, and how this fits into everything. I like to use Kevin Indig's concept of link power. Everybody uh, cringes when they hear the term link juice and uh, nobody wants to talk about um, kind of transferring page rank from one page to another because those are all kind of outdated concepts that don't really match what's actually happening. So when you think about link power, you're thinking about how these links impact other things on the website. And you hear a lot when you're talking about internal links about click depth, URL structure, and taxonomy. This is really more how this breaks down. So at its base level, we have tax taxonomy. And this is how your site is structured in terms of what do you name things and how are they broken apart. A lot of this has to do with internal corporate governance or logistics of shipping, of receiving, of inventory management, and that sort of thing. The main thing that matters when it comes to SEO and particularly link power are the keywords that you choose to use in the taxonomy. Because as everybody knows, anchor text does have a bit of influence on how relevant a link is determined to be. On top of that, we have the URL structure. Now this is the system of directories and subdirectories and pages. And this is really where we apply things like canonicals, nofollow, noindex, robots.txt. These things all matter to internal link power, but only in so much as they can kind of cut it off or consolidate it or reduce it, just depending on what's happening with those structure elements. Now, I've highlighted these in a lighter green because I want to point out that these are not really a matter, these are not really how link power is uh, measured. They're more how it's transferred from place to place. So keywords are going to be a lot more important. And then when we talk about click depth, what we're really talking about is the anchor text that's used the links into the page and the links out of the page. And the reason I think click depth is important to understand is because if we go back to that old model of three clicks from the home page is where you want to be, that's really not that true um, when you start thinking about click depth as links in and links out, regardless of where you are on the site. So there are plenty of sites out there that may have an article that they wrote I worked with one where they had an article that they wrote seven years ago that still was the highest trafficked page on their site. And it was because it had gone viral because it had been shared at a time of great need for that type of information. And they ended up getting a ton of quality links to that page. So when we thought about link power in that site, we thought about how the link power broke down from that most popular article as opposed to the home page because that article really was more often the starting point of the site. When you're dealing with interrank, particularly on oncrawl, segmentation is crucial. You have to make sure that you identify 
the different areas of the site or you will end up with a segmentation like this. So on the left there, you can see that this is the segmentation that we had for weight loss pages on a hospital project that I was working with. Um, because the segmentation for weight loss pages was only pages that contained the keywords weight or bariatric in the file names, that left 97% of the pages on the rest of the site that weren't accounted for. So when we're looking at this, we definitely want to go ahead and unclick that other so that we can see the rest of the pages. And so now we see that the treatment pages, you know, they're still like, you know, 0.01% of the total site, but just in the context of the weight loss section of the site, by doing this and breaking it down into a segmented area, we can get a lot more information about how these pages are linking to each other, even if they're not really linking even if they are linking with the rest of the site, but they're not really uh, all that connected to the other 97% of the pages. So just keep that in mind. Um, when we went through and looked at this particular situation, we discovered that there were tons of other pages that could still be appropriate to the weight loss pages, like support pages, error pages, legal pages. And then we also have a whole new section of COVID pages um, that are transferring some value depending. Um, there's been a lot written about um, staying healthy and uh, not gaining a lot of weight while you're while you're waiting uh, for COVID um, quarantine to end. I know it's something I've struggled with personally. It's just too easy to have uh, all of those snacks so close by. But as I said, you can have a flat architecture with good in rank. This, was a, this is a site that I work with that does third-party fulfillment. Um, so they will ship, pack and ship items for your company, um, which is really popular with people who have um, online marketplaces that are not as big as, say, Amazon or eBay that, that have to do their own, their own fulfillment and shipping. They'll outsource it to a company like this. What I find interesting about this site is we've done a really advanced segmentation here. So we have all of the really detailed segmentation happening over here on the right. But if you look at the average in rank by depth, you could see that this, is, this site has a very flat architecture. So it is between two and three for depth for almost all of its pages. Um, not ideal, I don't think, but because of the way that we've linked all of these pages together, you can see, looking at that diagram on the left, that there's a lot of connection between these pages, um, particularly fulfillment, which tends to be, which is the, the largest portion of the site and also tends to be the primary keyword. As I said, they provide third-party fulfillment, so it makes sense that that would be the the primary keyword. But this was not an easy segmentation to set up because we have a lot of crossover, like we have e-commerce fulfillment or warehouse fulfillment, um, 3PL fulfillment, like all of these different ways of um, describing what is essentially the same thing. Um, so to do this, we really took advantage of OnCrawl's um, integrated um, support for re for regular expressions. Um, so for example, the fulfillment category also does not contain warehouse e-commerce, 3PL, or Amazon, because those are all other areas that kind of crossed over. And we wanted to see these pieces kind of separately so that as the client is looking at key things that they want to rank for, we can look at those in a little bit more of a segmented way. So that's really the, the kind of background of, of how this works. And if you look at the same flat architecture, you can see that there are an average number of followed in links per page that is very consistent with these groups that we've set up. 
Now there's one here that is definitely piquing my interest and that is about. So one of the things we're gonna do is look through there and see what's going on with that with that about section. Um, if there's maybe some stuff that doesn't belong there or if there are maybe too many pages about what the customer provides that about what the company provides the customer that are not related to these core keywords. So some things to think about. Um, and you can see legal there also at 91 average followed in links. That's because it's a footer link. So legal includes terms and conditions, privacy policy, these things that have to be on the bottom of every single page. So that's why you see such a high rate there. Um, about to a certain extent as well, but we only have one about link on the footer. So. And if you don't believe it works, you can see if you look at the average in rank by SEO sessions, and this is a great section of the SEO impact report under internal popularity, as you can see over there on the left. You can see that the average in rank by SEO sessions, our highest number of sessions, also our highest in rank. So this is an example of a client that we've really got it right. Um, with an average in rank of 5.29 for anything over a thousand sessions, and that's per month, um, that gives us a great bit of information in terms of we're definitely putting the emphasis on the right syllable, as, uh, as Mike Myers would say. Sorry, Saturday Night Live, I'm dating myself here. But let's talk about some examples of actionable in rank use. So one of the things my client said to me, the same client who does the third party shipping, said, we wanna do better on keywords like alternative to Amazon FBA. So for those of you who aren't aware, um, Amazon has been reducing the speed at which they deliver non-essential goods. So if you are a company that provides something that is not considered essential during this COVID crisis, then you are seeing your fulfillment times, the time from the customer to make the purchase, to actually have it in their hand, go way up. Um, it is taking longer and it is taking a longer time to get those out. So a lot of companies that have been using Amazon for fulfillment are now looking for alternatives. And FBA, by the way, just means fulfillment by Amazon, but a lot of people search it as alternative to FBA or alternative to Amazon FBA. So we're looking for how can we do better on some of these keywords. Now there's definitely those basic optimization things like using the keyword more often in title tags, creating a good article about it, uh, getting some internal links to it, all these kinds of things, uh, external links, sorry, to it, all of these kinds of things. But there's somewhere else that InRank can help us here. So if we look at that same report, the average InRank by SEO sessions range, and we see that there's a little bit of an offset here. So 10 of 99 sessions actually has a 2.93 um, and 100 of 999 sessions uh, has a 2.42. Now that's not really a huge difference, but what I'm gonna do to try to figure out how to optimize this the best way is I'm gonna click on this 2.93 and open up the next screen. Now the next screen is gonna show me a whole lot of good stuff, but if I scroll down to the bottom, I can see the specific URLs that went into this particular um, in rank value. And what I can see is that, oh, look at that. We have a page called Amazon Fulfillment Alternative that's at a seven. That's a really high in rank. Um, so clearly we already have a page that's linked really well here. Um, and that's, and when I say linked really well, and remember I'm talking about internal links, not external links, um, because unfortunately we're not there yet, but hope to be at some point in the future. Um, we're looking at the 
Amazon Fulfillment Alternative page as being the best existing page that we have to optimize for the desired keywords. So that would be my recommendation to the client. And then also there's two other key, there's two other pages there, how to sell on Amazon and is Amazon FBA right for your business? Um, I would say that the client may want to consolidate that is Amazon FBA right for your business with the Amazon fulfillment alternative page. Um, because it seems like they say a lot of the same kind of thing and consolidating those could also transfer that additional in rank. Although it's only a one, it's not a super popular page, so we might as well consolidate it and create a little bit more value there. Here's another example. So they asked me, why does this e-commerce fulfillment resource get all the traffic when the in rank is only 1.62? So let's take a look at this. Again, we can use InRank to investigate this. We can go again to this SEO impact report and to the links section. And that's gonna pull up this average InRank by SEO sessions range. Same kind of thing we were looking at earlier, except that here we can see that that InRank is off a little. So 1.62, even though it's getting a tremendous amount of sessions, to me, that says there's some external factor that is creating a lot of sessions, but we're not effectively using the link power of this page. And sure enough, there it is. We've got our top in-link anchors, our understanding e-commerce fulfillment definition process and resources. So I looked at that article title and I thought, I'll bet we have done some kind of feature post or effort to grab external links from this post and sure enough absolutely it has some great inbound links so that is likely why this page is getting so much organic traffic um, and although its in rank is low it has a lot of link power so if we can get that in rank up higher so that it is a better connected page with the rest of the site, we can transfer that link power to some of the other pages. Um, and that is a you know, great example of how you can take an extra value from InRank and use external information to make decisions. All right, here's another example. When I have thousands of pages, how do I find which ones are being neglected? Um, and this is a common problem for a lot of sites, especially if you have a really huge site. Um, you can have a lot of pages out there that just really aren't doing much. And you can think to yourself, well, what can I do to give this page a little bit more power or to at least get some traffic to this page? So again, we can look at this page groups by depth. And this is in the crawl report. If we look down at internal popularity, we can see that these Navy pages here, and I've highlighted these, um, which you can do in, in on crawl. You just uh, hover over the one that you wanna highlight. And in this case, we've done fine doctors, physicians. So a lot of these deeper pages are the fine physicians pages. That means that the first time that Google sees these pages, for a lot of them, are at the ninth, 10th, and 11th depth. Now that's really deep. And then we have some that are at three and four, that's pretty shallow. So we've got some kind of unfairness in how these physicians' pages are being handled. Um, and in fact, it does play out in, we frequently have physicians call us up and say, you know, my colleague, Dr. Smith, is getting 10 times the number of leads that I am, so why is this? And a lot of times we use InRank to see, well, how deep is the first reference to your doctor page? Um, and sure enough, this, uh, this, at this depth 11, we have uh, Dr. West. Um, 
Dr. West is an extremely well-reviewed doctor. She has a 4.9 on Google reviews, and she's not linked to from any other pages on the site. Um, that five is just coming from canonicals and redirects and that sort of thing. It's not actually coming, and the five is the number of inlinks to that page, that there aren't really any major pages that she's getting linked to from. So my recommendation to the client was check the internal medicine treatment page to see why she was being left off. And sure enough, what they found out and this is just one of those logistics things, is that the template was only showing the first five doctors uh, that were associated in the database with whatever treatment, but especially with internal medicine. With a name like Dr. West, W being at the end of the alphabet, she was getting cut off every time. So she was not getting any link love from any of the other pages on the site. And even though she's a very well-reviewed doctor, she was getting cheated out of potential inbound leads. So how do we fix this? That's another question for another day. But essentially, um, we identified the problem and realized that, okay, we have to figure out something to be able to show all of the doctors um, and not just the top five. And in fact, we found that uh, a lot of the other doctors that were in levels nine and 10 were having the same problem. Um, this is again, one of those things where we uh, there are over 3000 doctors in the medical system, uh, in the hospital system. So it, we can't put them all on every page. Um, so some decisions had to be made um, and actually are still in the progress of being made. Um, but this is an example of how you can find those incredibly neglected pages. Any other things you should look for that you're just not paying attention to? Yes, there are tons of things you can look at. Um, I definitely like SEO active pages by depth. Um, this is under the SEO impact report and you go under links flow and then depth. Um, this is different from the crawl report and depth there. Um, and sometimes you will see this particular report end up getting um, crossed out um, because it's not available. And that goes back to your segmentation. Um, so make sure you do not have conflicts in your segmentation. As I said at the very beginning, it's super important that you get that right. But if we're looking at active pages in the structure, I see that when we get to level three, so depth three, we have more than half of the pages. No, sorry almost half of the pages are inactive. Now, what does that mean? Uh, it can be a lot of different things, um, but these are pages that are in the structure, but not getting any organic traffic when you connect them up to Google Search Console. Sometimes those are brand new pages that haven't had a chance to get traffic yet. Sometimes there are good reasons for it, like they're a series of paginated pages or they're canonicals or no follows or something like that. But if you click through, I add a little field to this report. When I do this report, I add and is indexable. And what I find is that if you add is indexable, then you don't spend all your time chasing down redirects and canonicals. So initially we were looking at a lot of pages. Um, there isn't a total on here, but um, I can tell you that it was about um, 58 pages um, that were considered inactive in the structure. And as soon as I add that is indexable field, so it takes out all of those things that are just there, but maybe because they have to be, maybe not, but they're actual valid pages that could be indexed, 
now we're down to 17. And then I can look at those pages and see that there are some patterns here, some things that I need to work on with my client to make sure that we're getting resolved. So of those 17 pages, um, I've highlighted just a few here. The first set of pages are the non-discrimination notice. And that non-discrimination notice is in multiple languages. Uh, so we have all of these multiple language non-discrimination notices that are no doubt required by our team on the, in the legal department, but they're not getting any traffic. So what I would recommend to the client is to either set the non-discrimination notice to no index, or if that's going to be a legal issue, they could even use href lang to give the different languages for each of these discrimination notices. That would put them into the active pages that are not indexable. And then the other thing that we saw that I saw is that there were a number of pages that are related to events um, and they either have the event and this is the link to cancel uh, your registration or the link to register for the event. Now, this one was a bit of a surprise to me because we had already dealt with this issue um, a few months ago and uh, I thought that it was resolved um, because we had uh, set this so that each of these variations, the cancel and the register, would canonical up to the main event page instead of being indexed independently. But by looking at the in-rank, looking at the links flow and the depth, I was able to see that, hey, guess what? This hasn't actually been fixed. And this is something that I may not have seen otherwise because this hospital system has over 300 events a month, uh, usually, not during COVID, obviously, but, uh, but usually they have over 300 events a month at different locations. So it becomes a situation where it's very hard to keep track of all of it uh, and to identify all of those pages. So there's another one, and that helps the client a lot. But wait, there's more. <laughs> so you can use these internal link reports for so many things. I've shown you how you can use them for optimization, how you can use them for troubleshooting. You can also use them for making a case. So one of the most popular ones that I hear are mega menus. Everybody wants a mega menu or a fat footer. Um, what I have found in multiple cases is that if your menu, the number of links in your menu is off balance from the rest of the pages on your site, I'll explain what I mean by that for in a minute. If it's off balance, you're going to see that the link power, the in rank of all of those other pages uh, is is overblown. So if you have every page of the site linking to every other page, you are essentially sending Google the signal that these are all so important that none of them are important. And you do not want to do that. You want to build that architecture. Whether you build it in the directory, subdirectory structure is not as important as if you build it in the navigation structure. Now, what I mean by saying out of balance, a site like Amazon or Home Depot can get away with a mega menu. In fact, in some cases it's needed because they need customers to be able to get to exactly what they're looking for. But if, as is the case with my, uh, with my shipping client, if you really only provide one primary service with just a few sub-services and your total site is only about 4,000 pages, then having 
200 links in the mega menu is is overkill. Um, it's really sending that signal that those in rank pages, it, it's really sending the signal that those pages are not important, um, which is not something that you want to do. You really have a limited amount of value to spread throughout your site. So when you have a smaller number of pages, you want to be really intentional about how you spread that value. And if you give too much of it to one place and not enough of it to another, then, then you do create a problem. And before you start thinking about page rank sculpting, this is just a little aside, it does not work. <laughs> um, there are multiple tests that have been done that show that it does not work. And as I understand it and have had confirmed by a couple of people who would know, AKA Googlers, um, when you have, let's say, 100 links on a page, um, every outbound link on that page gets one one hundredth of the value. If you cut off, let's just say, 10 of those links because they're privacy policy or whatever, and you don't want to be sending page rank to those, you don't then send one ninetieth to the other 90 links. You send one one hundredth to the other 90 links. So keep that in mind. Um, page rank sculpting does not work, but there is a lot of power in the internal links. And in rank is a terrific way to find that out and solve for it and make your case. So with that, I would love to hear your questions. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you very much for all these great conferences and all the takeaways you, you shared and the, the actionable examples. So I bet we have a few questions already. Um, feel free to add them using the chat section. Um, I've already shared the key takeaways from these conferences, so you can download them in the end of section. Um, so, first question, uh, when you segment a site, do you have tips to identify which section on the site break it down into? Does it always correspond to your uh, intended architecture? Yes and no. <laughs> so, um, when you're segmenting the site, you really want to segment it based on what matters to your client. Um, in the case of um, the hospital system, we segmented it based on treatments, locations, doctors, uh, just tried to think of the different ways that customers would, customers, patients, or prospective patients would come to the site and different ways that they would look for things. Uh, whether they were looking for information on a particular treatment or a particular lab process or if they were looking for uh, a particular doctor or just wanting to go somewhere near their home so location was more important and so we divided those up in that way um, in their case it followed a fairly clear structure of the subdirectory. So we have, you know, forward slash locations, forward slash treatments, forward slash find physicians. Um, so it was it was a little bit easier to do that one um, for the shipping site because they were they have such a flat architecture. Um, that one was a lot more difficult um, because I wanted to use the primary keywords that the client uh, is most focused on, and that's how we came up with e-commerce, fulfillment, warehouse, 3PL, and then I really had to do a pretty complex um, series of regular expressions to be able to break those down independently so that they didn't compete with each other. Um, but since doing that, we found that all of the information in Uncrawl is way more accessible and way more actionable than it used to be. Thanks. Um, I have another question. So, 
What's your take on flat versus deep URL structure for larger content sites that publish on a variety of topics? Um, I'm under the assumption, assumption sorry, that the URL structure doesn't matter so much for Google to understand the relevance, but rather it's the internal linking that matters. I think I understand what this questioner is asking, um, and feel free to drop in the chat if I'm if I'm not getting this right. Um, some of these really large publishing sites um, or some of the large e-commerce sites, um, it, you end up with a structure that can be 20, 30 levels deep for sure. Um, and what I recommend in that case is definitely do the main segmentation based on that structure, based on the, the important sections of the site. Um, but you may also want to create a separate segmentation. So one of the beautiful things about OnCrawl is that you can do multiple segmentations. So you may want to create a separate segmentation for each category within the publishing area. Um, for example, you might have um, a health uh, a health blog, and you want to do um, a separate uh, segmentation for men's health and women's health, let's just say. Um, there is going to be a little bit of crossover when we get into things like heart disease, but for the most part, um, your articles are going to be really targeted to either men or women, probably not, uh, probably not both. Um, and you may even want to do a separate section for general health um, that applies to anybody. So, look at those opportunities to try and kind of sub segment um, because then you can see a little bit more in terms of um, from one section to another like if we if we went back and looked at that screenshot that i shared of the weight loss section uh from this um from this hospital that i was working with um it's really only like 30 pages dedicated to weight loss topics. Um, and we included anything in the blog that mentioned weight loss in that segmentation as well. Um, and so you could see that like 96% of the rest of the site was not linking to that section, which was giving it kind of an artificially low in rank. But when we segmented it separately, that's when we started to really see and be able to work with um, how the weight loss section was working within itself. Makes sense, thank you. Um, I have a question from Rebecca. Uh, she's asking, so you talked about the example with Dr. West. Um, it sounds like you use a lot of external sources to evaluate the value of a page. Um, obviously, this varies based on the type of site and subjects, but are there types of outside sources that you absolutely recommend considering when establishing page content value and identifying pages to push using internal link architecture? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, uh, Majestic comes uh, integrated with uh, with OnCrawl, which I really like, um, and I've been a Majestic customer for a pretty long time. Um, but I also have used um, Ahrefs um, and um, uh, Christoph Semper's tool, uh, Link Link Research. I forget which <laughs> forget which one it is. Um, but it basically, it, I I definitely think that that inbound link value is really an important factor um because we absolutely see pages that are getting a lot of traffic that have a pretty lousy in rank in terms of what's just within on crawl um and uh, i've actually pushed rebecca a number of times to uh to integrate that with in rank um but i know that that would be a really complicated set of uh algorithms to do that and she'd basically probably be reverse engineering parts of Google. Um, <laughs> but it would be really nice to be able to say, you know, this particular page should start with an in rank of, I don't know, eight or nine. And then how does that impact the rest of the in rank on the rest of the site? That would be nice. Um, we actually have a lot of questions today. So um, <clears throat> let me grab another one. <laughs> So you mentioned that Google counts all links in terms of distributing page rank. 
What about multiple links going to the same page? Do they count? Do they get counted as one link, or however many are on the page? We're entering the realm of theory. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't think anybody has a definitive answer on this, um, but I have observed and I have seen others do tests that indicate that most likely. Um, multiple links to the same page will be considered one value. Um, now, if the anchor text is varied, you may see some variation on the anchor text as well. Um, but I believe, I'm sorry, on the value that's given to the anchor text, um, even though you know there's three links on the page that all link to the same thing, if the anchor text is varied, I do believe that they count them all as opposed to just one. But again, we're we're in the realm of theory here, folks. Like this is not <laughs> definitive. Please don't quote me on this. <laughs> um, but from what I from what I've seen, linking to a page multiple times from the same page usually does more harm than good. Um, unless it's something where it really just needs to be done that way to facilitate the navigation. You know, if you link to it in the navigation and in the footer and in the content of the page, I don't think anybody cares. <laughs> okay. Um, I have another question regarding the PR sculpting you mentioned earlier. Um, so, um, could, uh, so Hammer is asking, um, please could you say something about SharingRank? Are you saying um, PR sculpting is not working? Uh, should we ignore uh, this uh, sharing? I'm sorry, I don't really understand that question. Can you read it again? Um, so the question is asking if PR sculpting is not working, actually. So. Okay. So, I mean, Google's come right out and said it doesn't work anymore. It was one of those things that uh, SEOs took and beat to death with the hammer and now we don't use it anymore. Um, <laughs> I do think that, and again, realm of theory here, but I do think that Google is not gonna transfer the same value to your privacy page that's linked at the bottom of every page as it does to your main navigation. Um, I do think that there's some element of value or relevance that goes into how that value is transferred throughout the site, um, but um, but InRank, InRank does not use that. Um, InRank is really the original PageRank formula that you can go to Wikipedia and look up. <laughs> Um, another question is regarding the, um, is about uh, the segmentation. So, uh, could you say a little bit more about how segmentation works? Do you mean you segment the subcategories manually or with Encrow? Easy one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not easy, actually. <laughs> um, I do both. <laughs> um, so, um, one of the things that Uncrawl does that I really love is that it allows me to import a JSON file um, if I want um, to do a custom segmentation, and uh, I frequently do that. I will build the segmentation externally in something like Excel, and then um, just write it out in JSON. Uh, so that I can then upload it into Uncrawl and use it that way. Um, and I do that most of the time because I want to be able to show the customer uh, what I'm doing with the segmentation and make sure that I'm on the mark and that I'm not missing something that they find really important. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so I think we have time for two more questions. So, um, so you mentioned that Flux flat architecture is the old way, and crawl depth is more or less not important. Um, so Emma is asking, I'm not sure about this. Uh, could you say a little bit more about this to help me understand um, and share any sources to follow up on this? Thank you so much. Yeah, so um, I, I do think that crawl depth can be important. Um, I, I just think that crawl depth can start from anywhere. 
Um, if you think about uh, just think about the old methods of way way back in the day before search engines, we got from page to page on the internet by following things like web rings. Um, so they just link to the home page of the site, and then any other traffic that went to any sub pages uh, was usually usually started from the home page. Um, so I think as SEOs, we have a tendency to kind of get stuck in that feeling that the home page needs to be the start page of the site, um, but it doesn't need to be the start page of the site. And what we see now is that with the advent of search engines, particularly search engines like Google, that can crawl so deeply into our sites, your start page could be anywhere. And so that's what I mean when I say that, you know, that that depth doesn't, doesn't matter as much as we used to think it did. Um, because people can start from any any page on the site. So you could start your depth of one from a page that's five levels deep if you want to. So that's why I say, you know, take depth a little bit um, with a grain of salt. But a flat architecture can be difficult primarily just because it's hard for Google to understand how the site is put together. Um, if you have a situation where you have pages that are inside of pages that then build subdirectories it it can be very hard for google to figure out where it is that you're trying to go with this um and there's a big difference between a flat architecture from the standpoint of directories and subdirectories and a flat architecture from the standpoint of navigation so if you have a situation where you're going to the to the start page whatever that start page is and you can't figure out where in the site you are or where you need to go to get x y or z that is relevant to your purpose for being in there in the first place then you probably have a fairly broken architecture um, and again it, it doesn't really matter um, whether it's um, eight levels deep or 11 levels deep, um, the idea is just to create that consistency between the experience um, and the architecture overall. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. <laughs> <laughs> um, the last one, so you said seven was a really high in rank in the Amazon FBA example. Um, mm -hmm. Is there good or bad earrings uh, relative to your sites or have you found that they are there's concrete values you should all be aim, aiming for well i mean you always want to get as close to 10 as possible because the in rank is valued between zero and 10. so yeah <laughs> you, you want them all to be as close as possible to 10 because that would be a perfect site if everything was at a 10. um it probably wouldn't be actually it'd probably be a really flat architecture site that's hard to tell where you're going um <laughs> but at any rate um it's um it, yes i think that there's you know a goal that you should set but that that goal is going to vary based on your site um if your site is three million pages then it's going to be really hard to have more than just a handful of pages that are like seven and above um, if your site is 200 pages then you should have probably a third of them that are at a seven or above. You know, it's 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 all mm. relative, is what I'm trying to say. Um. Okay, last one. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you ever use <laughs> Do you ever use log analysis to validate uh, architectural changes? All the time. Um, <laughs> so uh, again. One of the reasons I love OnCrawl is because they have the data ingestion feature. So I can take any val any data that I want to, um, and especially log files, and 
put them into the system and it'll crunch the numbers and tell me what the differences are between the crawl and the logs. And that can be super helpful for identifying pages that are underperforming or pages that are getting a lot of traffic but not a lot of organic traffic. So there, there can be a few different ways of looking at that that can be really helpful. Um, but of course that requires external uh, number crunching and, and uh, exports and that sort of, sort of thing. Um, but yeah, the, the, the data ingestion tool, the, the, the um, scraping capability um, that are in on crawl are really terrific. Um, I don't know that those really have that much to do with Interact though. <laughs> Um, thank you very much, Jenny. Um, thank you for sharing your experience today regarding internal linking and how you use the in rank. Um, we think we've learned a lot. Um, so <laughs> thank you again. Um, thank you for everyone for attending this episode. Um, we're going to have a next one um, next week about how to use automation for high error SEO tactics. Uh, we'll have Will Critchlow, Aleda Solis. Jair Ox and Dan Taylor on May 12th. Uh, so don't forget to sign up. It's going to be epic as well. Um, and thank you everyone again for your participation. Um, have a good day and stay safe. Bye. Bye-bye.